Hey, I just wanted to take just a moment uh, to say thank you guys so much, and I, I hope that you were encouraged throughout this week. Um, last week, like Nate said at the beginning, we preached. Uh, things didn't go exactly the way we, bless you again, the way we uh, had planned exactly, and uh, we, we went into a message called The Secret Place um, out of Matthew chapter 6, just talking about where God can be found. And if you missed that, Excuse me. If you missed that, I want to encourage you. Go to the app. It's the easiest way to, uh, to uh, find our sermons. It's ALCCGI on your Google Play or on your, uh, in your app store. Free download. Uh, all of our sermons and sign-ups and event calendars, everything's on there. But if, if you missed that, I want to encourage you to, to go to that place. How many of you had the opportunity to do some, at least one of the secret places and you posted or you, you saw something or, you know, I had people from all over uh, messaging me, hey, what's the secret place thing about? Um, I'm like, you have to watch the sermon. I'm, I'm not giving you no free passes, no freebies. Um, but I want to encourage you, go back and watch it if you missed it and join in. Um, we, this thing will either die off or we can create uh, an even, even greater movement um, via social media, via uh, uh, your life. It's, all it is is telling people what God has done in your heart that day with the hashtag secret place. And so um, if you want to jump on board with that, come on, let's do it. Let's keep it rolling, keep it moving, and uh, it's going to be really good. Today we have an incredible honor and opportunity, and uh, I am excited about it. Um, I, I get the chance to introduce a young lady that came to us. Uh, a little over, well, she's been in Grand Island for about three years, three and a half years, five years, 17 years, something like that. Uh, three years, and uh, she's been on staff, she's been on staff for two and a half years here at Abundant Life. Uh, she is our office manager, uh, does everything as far as organizationally keeping us uh, in line. And if you know anything about our staff, you know that that in its of itself is a, just a full-time gig putting up with us and uh, telling us where we need to be and, and why we need to be there and uh, checking our attitudes and all that kind of stuff. And so she's an amazing young lady. And through this process of her just coming on staff, God has really done a work in her about ministry and what that looks like in her role and what it, what it looks like for her to step out and be vulnerable and, and step out into ministry. And it's such an honor to, uh, to have watched her grow through these last couple years and, and to hear some of her goals and her heart. Uh, I'm excited for her. Uh, for where God is taking her. And this is just an incredible step in her journey. Uh, this will be the first time that she has uh, ever spoken publicly to this many people. And so I would ask that you would uh, be very courteous and gracious and loving and kind as you always are. But would you do me an incredible honor today and help me in honoring Laura Hushik as she comes to share the word with us this morning. Oh, you guys. Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? Hello, testing. Check on the one, mic check two. Sorry, okay. Hey, guys. Hi. Hey. Oh, I am so excited. I'm so excited. Um, Jay kind of stole a little bit of my intro, but I'm just going to know it's okay. Just, I wanted to kind of, I figured, like, like he said, this is the first time I've really spoken to the max group of you. And so I was like, well, I'm going to like, let you guys get to know me a little bit better, some tidbits about myself. Um, I came to Grand Island about five years ago. It'll be five years this spring. And I came by way of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I made a good friend there, Hope Nelson, and she used to um, bring me with her for family visits home. And I just fell in love with the people I met, and specifically this church. And I actually had this quiet hope in my heart, this prayer that I could live where this church is. And... I kind of was thinking about it this weekend, and I actually, I kind of moved for the church overall. Like, I had no family here. I have no roots here. I hadn't even visited Nebraska before I knew Hope, but I wanted to live where this church was. And so the fact that I'm on staff, like, the map of my life that God laid out, I had no idea. And I just, I can't express enough the gratitude I have, first of all, for God's just his ways, but specifically to you guys that you will allow me this honor today to talk to you and to share my heart with you. Um, you'll notice um, my enchanting dialect. It's because I'm from Minnesota. And so, um, 
you'll hear some O's and some O's and some A's that you're not familiar with, but just this is how it's supposed to sound. So you guys just embrace the proper dialect. <laughs> this, is, this is the Lord's will. But <laughs> let's just start with some prayer, okay? Oh, Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that this is a moment in time that you were aware of from the beginning of time. So we set aside our intentions, our affections, all that we are and have before your throne, God. Share this time with us as we share with you, God. And please, Father, just speak through me and give me the words on your heart. In your precious name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so flash review. We've been doing a series on vulnerability. Um, first, Jay talked about the four elements of vulnerability, how we were made for connection, that God designed that intricately in us. As human beings, we're not meant to be alone. The song, No Man is an Island. It's true. Um, <laughs> it requires courage to seek out connection. It's not easy sometimes to reach out. There's always that element, the potential to be rejected, to the potential to be denied for a broken heart. But vulnerability asks us to be courageous in that. It also requires compassion, first of all, for ourselves. If we can't be kind to ourselves, how in the world can we be kind to others? And like the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you haven't the capacity to be kind and loving towards yourself, chances are your neighbor is experiencing the same thing that you're treating yourself with. Um, the enemy of vulnerability is isolation. In isolation, we reject connection. We are afraid. In isolation, we're not kind. And so that in itself is just earmarks and tools to guide us onto where our vulnerability and how, how that's doing is. Um, and then last week, we talked about the secret place, um, that we can always find God in the secret place. And if ever we're wondering where he is, He's told us in Matthew, he's in the secret place. And so when we step into intimacy and quiet ourselves into that secret place, we will always find him, and there's always more and a deeper depth. And again, that requires vulnerability because it's a laying aside of yourself to have more of God. And sometimes that laying aside is a painful process, but you get more of God. Um, so um, truly vulnerability isn't a one-step thing, and I think that's, for me, one of the most fr like frustrating components is that it's not like a one and done thing, but it's a lifetime of steps. I will never stop learning how to be vulnerable. I will never have it right, and sometimes I will downright hate it, but it is a lifetime of steps that we all get to take. Um, I myself, I, I want to preface with this, that you guys don't assume like, oh, she's just like this vulnerability bunny who just loves to be vulnerable and tender-hearted, who will cry at the drop of a hat. I really, my natural tendency is to not be vulnerable. Um, I am an internal process, processor slash overthinker. So I will, something will happen, and I will replay it in my mind. I will pick it apart, replay it in different scenarios, pick that apart, find solutions, find reasons, find explanations, and, <laughs> and I'm extremely stubborn, so I won't stop until I've decided to stop. And um, that's not something that vulnerability really fits into the equation with. If I'm going to pick apart and find solutions for things, there's no time for me to say, God, here's my heart. Have your way. Have control. Move how you will. Especially when I'm like, I've got this figured out, and if I don't, I will figure it out. And God, eventually, you're going to figure it out that I'm figuring it out. Um, so I just I want to be honest that this is not my natural inclination. Um, but... I am learning how power, powerful vulnerability is. And so even though it goes against what I naturally do, I am learning to fight for it and to say yes to those moments of because I'm learning how deeply valuable they are. Um, and like Jay said, this is the first time I've spoken on a Sunday morning to like, well, <laughs> to this many people. And this right now, guys, we are in a moment of vulnerability together. I am exposing my heart to you. I am sharing something that's deeply precious to me, and I don't know what you'll do with it. You may right now be ignoring my very words. You may not care. I can't control that, 
But because of the secret place that I have with God and because of what he's asked me to do, I have to say yes. Who am I to deny God? But because he asked, I know he'll move. I know he'll be glorified by it. So today I want to talk to you guys about three people in the Bible. Hagar um, is going to show us that we can't run from our situations, but we can press into the will of God. And through intimacy, we will see his purpose fulfilled in all that we do. David is going to show us that we can't run from our emotions, but our emotions can be a platform for worship to honor God and all, and all that's happening around us. And lastly, Jesus, perfect Jesus, um, is the example that we can't deny the will of God for our lives. And if we submit our, our path and our emotions, he will fulfill a greater work in us. Um, so for Hagar, um, this is a story out of Genesis 16. Just a quick summary. This is in the time of Abraham and Sarah. They have been given the promise that Abraham will be a father of many nations, but they have no son. And so right now, Sarah is seeking out her own solution. And it was a custom at that time that a wife would give one of her slaves or servants to her husband, and the child that was produced would belong to the couple. So Sarah gave Hagar, one of her servants, to Abraham, but the child that was conceived was immediately hated by Sarah. Sarah said, the moment I found out she was pregnant, I hated her. And Abraham basically gave Sarah permission to handle it how she wanted to. And what Sarah wanted to do was be cruel and unkind to a point that Hagar fled. The, like she was, the situation was so abusive, she just couldn't stay. And God encounters her in the wilderness, and he asks her two questions. Where have you come from, and where are you going? And we all know that when God asks questions, it's not because he doesn't know but he needs us to see a new perspective. And so she tells him everything of like the situation, what's happening, she's pregnant, she's getting beat up by this woman who made her get pregnant in the first place. And like God hears all this and he has a simple request, go back, submit yourself to Sarah. And then he begins to prophesy over her, over the son she was carrying, Ishmael, over her future. And this was a tender, intimate encounter and Hagar actually gave God a new name in that moment, el Rai, the God who sees. And this isn't um, like a, oh, notice kind of see of like, oh, yeah, yeah, there you are. It's not a where's Waldo kind of situation. But this is a, a to the very core, under layers and layers, to the depth of who we are, he sees. He knows and he sees. Um, and so, like, we can relate to Hagar on this, that pain isn't something that we will willingly experience. I can't say, hey, can I punch you? Oh, abs absolutely. Please do. I, physically, God has designed our bodies to avoid pain. We flinch. We, we withdraw. If I, if I get burnt, like I burnt myself with a curling iron on my forehead. I didn't keep the curling iron on my forehead, you know? Like, our bodies are designed to keep us safe and alive. And even our brains are hardwired to defend ourselves, even in social situations. It's amazing if you guys do the research. Like, God, to the very core, to every nerve ending, is designed to protect ourselves. So it's our nat natural inclination. And the human experience like, involves challenges. It could be personal. Like, with goals you're trying to achieve, physical, like, health issues, it could be in relationships. Like you're fighting to save your marriage or you're working up the nerve to ask out that cutie who's preaching up front today. Pause for it. I'm kidding. Shout out. Um, <laughs> it could be with family. You know, you could be waiting for a child that you've been praying for. You could be praying for a prodigal to come home. But um, this story with God and Hagar shows us um, that sometimes when we want to run, it is the time to stay, or rather, go back to the place we've run from. Hagar's intimate encounter with God, listen to this, was enough to convince her that an abusive situation was the best place for her to be. Sarah hadn't, in this process, all of a sudden, like, oh, no, it's cool, it's cool, come back, chill with me. Hagar had to willingly choose to go back to a place where she knew she'd be physically and emotionally abused, but 
because God met with her. They created a secret place together. She knew that this was what he desired. And uh, she knew he'd bring it purpose. This is what intimacy and vulnerability does. When we can submit the things that, like God, it'd be easier not to do this, but we sense his leading in the direction of pain. We know and can trust that he will bring purpose to it. He is the one that makes it matter. Um, even pain itself can be a map um, for the condition of our heart. Kind of like when we have physical pain, that it is um, a way for doctors to find out what the problem actually is. You know, we can mask it with Tylenol, with painkillers and stuff, but that pain in itself is a road map to find out where the problem is. And same with our emotional pain. Um, I, I was thinking about this last night, and God reminded me, like, in childhood, like, when you'd skin, like, fall and skin your knee, it hurts, especially on gravel. <laughs> God, I remember those times where, like, mom would, like, pick up little pebbles of gravel in my knee. Oh, it hurt. Um, and then, but this was the worst part, the rubbing alcohol that was poured on top. It wasn't enough that I've fallen and flayed parts of my skin off of my body, but now you want to go ahead and pour rubbing alcohol on it, and that burns terribly burns. But then God gave me this, this connection point of when we're hurt, sometimes it takes something a little bit more painful for in the end to heal completely. Like if we didn't have that disinfectant applied to our wounds, there's a chance for infection or for a worse problem to happen. So think of it this way. Sometimes when we think there's enough pain in my life I can't handle anymore, what if that extra dose of discomfort is the thing that's going to make your heart heal properly and completely. Um, Romans 8.28 says, and we know all things work together for good, to, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is what I've learned. If we remove or we withdraw, we are simply robbing ourselves. God is giving a free gift, and sometimes it costs something. Like not in the sense of like we have to earn the free gift, but to be, to find deeper places in that secret place, it's not always easy. Um, there are lessons to be learned, wounds to be healed, truths to be revealed about who we are, who God says we are, and about ultimately who he is. And if we rem, um, run away, how are we going to know? How are we going to know? Um, vulnerability asks us not to run but like Hagar, to go back to the place we've run from and let God bring purpose to it, to allow the Holy Spirit to comfort you through heartache or discomfort until you're healed completely. Next is David, good old David. I think about this, and I think about this story, and his life was just one giant drama. Um, this actually is from 2 Samuel, and it's like covered in a couple different chapters, um, but this story involves David, two of his sons, Absalom and Abnon, Amnon, I think I'm saying that right, and one of his daughters, Tamar. And it involves rape, murder, um, lies, deceit, and eventually um, David is overthrown. Um, his son Absalom murders his other son, flees, runs away, is eventually restored over a five-year process, and within the ho walls of the home he was restored to, he leads a rebellion against his father. So in this upheaval, this family turmoil. David writes this out of Psalm 55, 4 through 8. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So that I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. This is just a very poetic way to say, I wish I wasn't here right now. I wish this wasn't happening. And like Hagar, David wanted to run, but he doesn't. Um, instead, he acknowledges his Savior, his King. In that same chapter, he goes on to say, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. In verse 22, he says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. David knew he couldn't escape his situation. He couldn't escape what was going on, but at the same time, he had these emotions, these feelings. He was feeling all kinds of stuff. Granted, he was allowed to. He was 
on the run from his own home, betrayed by his own son. Like, that's got to break a person's heart. Um, but because of his intimacy with God, out of that relationship, that secret place, that's big, um, he knew his emotions were a product of the situation. And so he began declaring what, he, yeah, he began declaring in worship the characteristics of God that he needed to see in his broken heart. He says, the Lord shall save me. He will sustain me. He will not permit the righteous to be moved. These aren't things that he was describing as they were happening. These were things he needed God to be in his life. He was still on the run. He was still being betrayed by his family. But he knew God well enough to know who he was and what he could provide. He could provide a firm foundation where the righteous wouldn't falter. He knew God would be a place where anything can be sustained by his power. And so that was what he focused on. He didn't say, like, God, I'm being betrayed. He, he does in some chapters, but in this moment, he knew, he knew how to access the heart of God. And sometimes I feel like our emotions can get a bad rap. Um, we kind of, we filter our feelings or we try to control our emotions um, in ways that God didn't ask us to. We label our emotions as good or bad, and it starts this chaotic cycle of pride or shame. Because in pride, those emotions feel good, but guess what? You have to maintain them by your own power. And eventually, that's going to stop because we're humans. And in shame, we are constantly trying to fight to find freedom. So all of a sudden, this is where our attention is, of like filtering our emotions, cleaning up these messes, and we lose sight of God entirely. Um, but this is, I found this verse, and it just cheered my heart so much. Um, we can't condemn ourselves by our feelings because God does not condemn our feelings. Um, in 1 John 3, 19 through 20, it says this, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So what more can be said about it? We can spend our entire lives sorting through our emotions, saying, this is good, this is bad. God wants to see this. God will despise that. But in the end, it says he knows your heart, and even more than that, he is greater than your heart and does not condemn you. So there's the simple truth. Don't, don't put yourself through that work. Um, vulnerability allowed David to use his emotions as a platform to, wor to worship. It is what guided his worship. And guys, like, oh, I may cry. Who cares? I'm being vulnerable, right? <laughs> Your life is one song that will never be repeated. And so if you want to give God worship, live your life. He made you uniquely. There is no one like you, and no one will live the life that you live, think like you do, experience things like you do. And because of that, your song of worship will, be like, will not be like any others. So often I think we, we put ourselves in these margins of like, well, I'm like everybody else. What's one more voice in the throng? But if you think about it, God can hear everything. He knows all things. And he wants to hear your life song just from you. And one way to do that is through these experiences of our emotions. In loneliness, we get to worship the God who never will leave you or forsake you, who knows the number of hairs on your head. In fear, he is the God who tells us, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. When we're happy, we get to worship the one who delights in us, who is joy himself. Even in this, in this sense of adventure, when these moments of like, oh, I'm ready for the next thing. I'm ready for newness. I've got this drive and this passion. Guess who you get to worship? The God who will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. There is never a moment in our life where God is not deserving of our praise. And scripture becomes sacred facts through worship. These are all like found in the Bible. These aren't just words, but these are truths, truths that we get to apply in worship with our lives. Um, the choice of vulnerability means sharing all that we feel with him, even when it's easier to control the feeling itself. Um, it means dancing before God while we weep. There is truth that joy and mourning are commingled. 
I, like, in my own life, and I'll talk about this later on in my testimony, but in my own life, I've known great joy and great sorrow at the same time because my eyes will physically see decay and dismay around me, but my heart sees my Father. And so while I weep over what I see, my heart rejoices over what I know. And that is because our emotions are our compass. Don't, don't focus on stuffing the feelings or controlling that. But if you give your heart to God as a compass, he will guide your worship. And through that worship, he will guide you to depths of your heart that you wouldn't have accessed otherwise. Oh, lastly, sweet Jesus, our precious Jesus. In Luke 22, 39 through 44, it's this little clip it right before um, he's crucified. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into, into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if this is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. This was the night our salvation began. And Jesus, Jesus was acutely aware. He was very aware of what was about to happen. And like Hagar and David, he was very honest with God. He voiced his desire. Like, I wish this wasn't happening. If it is your will, take this cup from me. He didn't hide his emotions. Even while he was strengthened, he was in agony. He didn't spend time of like, no, this is God's will. This is what he wants me to do. I have to be strong. I have to be tough. This is how you get through it. He, he was so distraught. His sweat was like drops of blood. He was very honest with what he was feeling. But the thing to note is he still submitted himself to his father's will. And again, in his agony, he found strength. So we can't believe this, this thing of like, well, God didn't come to strengthen me because I still feel this way. But sense those places where in the discomfort, there's something changed. All of a sudden, you find more sure footing. Um, he didn't run. He didn't try to control his emotions. He didn't try to control his feelings. But he submitted himself to God because God had begun a work before time began that Jesus needed to finish. And this is the humbling thing. Even in this small, small way, we get to relate to Jesus in the fact that if we submit and say yes, to something God had designed for us before we were even born, he will bring beautiful things from it. And it may require a cost. It may require discomfort and pain. It may not come easily. But in that submission, in that yes, his will has a, a place to bloom and grow in us. Um, our faith is very important to God. It is a high priority for him as our father to mold us and shape us as his children. This is something he really finds important. Um, in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, it says this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I don't know if you guys picked up on this, but there's this line that says, whom having not seen you love. But it's surrounded by this, with various trials, being tested by fire, being purified. And... This is something that God has shown me, that this is a love story. Like, in the journey that I'm walking through right now, I have fallen more deeply in love with Jesus because of the things that have tested me, that have burdened me, that have caused me pain. And because of that love, like, we see glimpses of Jesus. In the secret place, we see glimpses of Jesus, and it makes us fall in love. It gives us a greater capacity for faith. 
We receive joy beyond explanation. We receive happiness in places where it makes no sense. But ultimately, we are saved. Um, I myself, um, I've learned the power of vulnerability um, through a family illness. Um, this, is, this is where the vulnerability rubber meets the, <laughs> the vulnerability road, if you will. <laughs> um, about a year after I moved to Grand Island, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And um, it has been a journey, quite a journey. Um, I can't run from this. This isn't something that's just going to not exist if I ignore it. Um, if I were to cut myself off from my family, and specifically my father, it would mean more loss than what is being taken already. Um, first, like my instinct was just to cover my ears, shut my eyes, and just like, I think we've all done this, of like, this isn't happening, this isn't happening, this isn't happening. But God, in my seeking of him, in my just in my broken heart of like, why is this happening? This doesn't have to be this way. I know you're the healer. I know you can change this. I know you can save him. I know this can stop. I learned that in this position, I can't see him move. So I have to live heart open, eyes open, so that I can see his hand. Yes, I see. I see the things I don't want to see. But if I were to shut up and all my emotions, if I were to stop looking, I wouldn't see God either. I would start believing this lie that, God, you're not there. God, you've left me in the darkness. God, you didn't care enough to meet me here to come when I needed you. But the tr plain truth is, I was just like this. He was right in front of me. But in this position of cowering, of choosing to stay in the dark, I would begin to believe this lie that he wasn't there at all. So yes, I see, I see, I see everything leaving. Sometimes it feels like it's leaving one thing at a time. My dad had very tan skin. He loved to be outside. His hands were rough. He worked with his hands a lot. He was a truck driver. And he prided himself on maintaining the lawn and, and keeping the house clean structure strong and steady and these were things that you know growing up they identify as part of who your father is and now his skin is pale his hands are soft so these things that i know my dad to be are slowly leaving and sometimes it feels like one thing happens and my heart recovers and there's a new thing that just sends my heart reeling again. And um, I'll be honest, like layers of my heart are being stripped away. But because of these emotions, because of this heartache, my life is a pool of worship that will never have stagnant water. I have determined in my life, and this is what I want to challenge you with as well, that in these moments where it's easier to say, God, why? I reject you right now because my life is this way. But, oh, this is, this is maybe like the sassy rebellion in me, which I think God has definitely designed. But in my, like, I know for a fact that Satan will not steal an ounce of worship from my life no matter what the situation I face. Right? And we all need to have that determination in our lives. That sorrow will come. It is guaranteed that this is not always going to be easy. But we have the choice to say, no matter what, God, you will be glorified. No matter what, God, I will see your goodness and I will see your hand. And sometimes our emotions have to be the key to find him. Like I know for myself personally in these moments where even, even like this week, I'll be very honest, like I got a birthday card this week from my parents. And my dad is a lefty, and he always had this handwriting that was equally strong and graceful. It was, and he prided himself that he was a lefty, and he had good handwriting. And in this card, um, my mom had to translate his writing underneath. He 
he wrote endearments, but I couldn't understand them anymore. And it was, oh, a fresh knife, a, a new thing gone. And um, so I had to, to choose to stop and say, Lord, these are my emotions. I am very angry right now. I am very upset. And I would start singing this song, God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. And it goes on to say, I will love you, Lord, my God. I will love you, Lord, my strength. All these things. I used my emotions as a place where God could meet me and be glorified. I didn't take my emotions and say, control them, Laura. This isn't the time or place. Just because this isn't happening, this isn't about you. Stop feeling this way. But instead, I'm like, I, I walked into the secret place. I said, God, more again? And nevertheless, you be glorified. Nevertheless, you move. You have your way. Um, don't get me wrong. Like, this isn't something that I've perfected. It's definitely flawed sometimes in this area. Um, I'm still on a journey, and so, therefore, I'm still learning. And Jody, can I have you come up? Um, it's a little bit faster than I thought it would. It's all right, though. Um, I want to challenge you guys with where you're at. Um, oh, Holy Spirit, come. Are there places in your life where it was easier just to walk away than to stay, even though you knew God asked you not to? Are there challenges in your life that just never seem to go away, no matter how much you ignore it? Are there emotions that you feel and you become so entangled with controlling them that you trapped yourself? your heart and ask yourself how much of God have I really given him how much vulnerability am I really walking in am I letting him use everything if I, am I giving him access to everything if we say yes if we do then we will see his completed will in our lives I'm in the middle of this not over yet. But that just tells me that God has more. He has more. He has more worship that he's deserving of. And he has more destiny to fulfill in our family. Not only myself, but my father. He is still in the hands of God Almighty. So I want to challenge you guys with this. Are you willing to let your lives be the worship song that God deserves? Are you willing to be vulnerable and intimate enough in the secret place that you don't need to carry in an organizational chart to control what you're going through? You can just spill it all out before the throne. Right now, I want to challenge you guys. We're going to sing a song of worship together.